everyone. This is the Garden in the Panhandle Live, the June 10th edition, and we're talking about ornamental and turf diseases today. So welcome everyone uh, in Zoom land and on Facebook world. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, and I guess you can do it on Facebook too, we got someone monitoring over there, uh, use the chat and tell us where you're from. I see Clara Mullins, that's a familiar name in Leon County. Hello everyone, my name is Mark Tansig. I am the horticulture agent in Leon County. I'm actually coming to you today from Gadsden County where I'm helping out uh, with some stuff over here. And we have an awesome panel of guests or speakers for you today. Uh, we have some extension agents and we're also really lucky to have a plant pathology expert. So we're talking diseases. So we need a plant pathologist, right? When we need a bug person, it's the entomologist, all those ologists, right? The entomologist, the pathologist, taxonomist. Today we got our plant pathology expert. So uh, let me go around and introduce the agents first. So coming to us from Okaloosa County, we have Larry Williams. Hey, Larry. Hey. It's good to be here, and um, I want to say I've never met a plant pathologist that I didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> Larry's always got jokes, too. All right, and then we have Stephen Greer coming to us from Santa Rosa, right? Or yes, Stephen that's correct. Yeah. All right. Ah, well, I'm glad to be here. It's good to get out of the CED role and jump into the Horde agent role. That's fun stuff. Yeah, uh, and... Lord knows we get a lot of disease questions. Uh, I don't know about the rest of y'all agents, but anyone getting brown patches of grass questions these days? A couple, yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> then we also have Matthew Orwat. Hello, Matthew Orwat from Washington County. Thank you, happy to be here. And I'm very pleased to serve you today as your horticologist. <laughs> and. And I know, please, I hope someone asked a question about diseases on roses, because Matthew is our, you know, rose expert. So if you ever want to know anything about a rose plant, contact Matthew Orwa. Uh, and then last but not least, we have our expert, Dr. Phil Harmon. Uh, Dr. Phil Harmon, tell us where you're calling us from and tell us a little bit about your role with Extension. Jerry, thanks, Mark. I've uh, been with UF now uh, 17, 18 years, and I am an extension plant pathologist stationed here in Gainesville, but I have statewide responsibilities for turf and ornamentals as well as blueberry production throughout the state of Florida. As a plant pathologist and extension specialist, I work with county faculty, I work with growers to come up with practical solutions for disease problems that, that come up and, and ruin our day for whatever reason, whether it's our lawns, our blueberries, um, etc. So I'm uh, very happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Looking forward to some lively discussion and good questions about plant pathology and diseases that uh, that we experience here in Florida quite, quite frequently. All right, great. We're really, uh, we're happy to have you here and we're glad you uh, took up uh, Julie's invitation. So yeah, we, we got folks in the background that are helping make all this work as well, everyone. So we have Julie McConnell. She's our Bay County horticulture agent. She's kind of our producer. She makes sure that uh, the, the lighting's good, but she's also in control of all the technology that's making all this happen. So thank you, Julie. And then we also have Pat Williams, the Wakulla County, everything, you know, CED, Hort Ag agent, natural resource agent. Uh, I think he is manning the Zoom or Facebook or one of them. Uh, Matthew Lawler is back there as well. Matt is our Hort agent out of out of Santa Rosa. Is it Santa Rosa, Stephen? All right. Yes, it is. Look, I got everyone's counties right. Okay, so we're talking plant disease. It's Florida. It's the southeast, right? It's hot. It's humid. Uh, we tend to get a lot of diseases, and so I did want to start out. So folks watching via Zoom had the ability to send in their questions, so we're going to go through those questions. Uh, folks on Facebook, you can ask along the way. And folks on Zoom as well, you can ask in the Q&A. And before we get started into the folks that call or uh, ask their particular questions, I did want to ask Dr. Harmon to go over just a couple things in general about disease, right? So I guess what when we talk plant disease, what kind of organisms are we dealing with? And what are the, what are just some general things we can do to prevent 
having diseases in the first place that we have to stress out about. Yeah, th thanks, Mark. Uh, so plant diseases are, are common. They are complicated because uh, what we're dealing with with a plant disease is, a, is an interaction between the host plant that we're trying to grow and a pathogen. And so uh, where we have um, in, in other damages that can occur to plants, maybe one factor, here we have two living organisms that have to be existing in the same space during the same time, and they have to be interacting during a period that's conducive to disease occurring. Infection, disease symptom development are all parts of the plant disease process that lead to plants being sick, sick, sick plants, um, can really uh, ruin our day. We can have uh, sick plants due to pathogens. We can have plants that die for other reasons. And so, um, you know, as a plant pathologist, what we always start with and, and when talking about plant disease is the plant disease triangle. And, you know, we have these host plants, um, we have pathogens, and then we have the environment that they're existing in. And we think about that, that disease triangle as a target, okay? And the larger that target gets, the more likely when we toss a dart up there, it's going to hit within that plant disease triangle and we're going to see disease. In Florida, as was mentioned, we have very uh, humid, wet weather, and uh, many of our pathogens require moisture to be able to do their thing. So when it's swampy out and, and wet and hot, that's when fungus thrives. That's when we have an environment that can be uh, better for fungal growth than it can for plant growth. So our environment is conducive. We have plenty of pathogens in the state of Florida that affect many of our, our plants, all of our plants that we, that we try to grow. Um, the, the most common group that we deal with are fungi. Uh, those are um, uh, good and bad. We have some, some chemical management options for them. Uh, when you're talking about palms and others, we have bacteria and viral diseases as well. It can be a little more difficult to manage and, and, and diagnose. So uh, we have these organisms in Florida that, that exist. We have the plants that uh, can become susceptible for various reasons. So, um, you know, as we go through the, uh, the discussion today, we have to keep in mind that, that uh, plants are both much simpler, of course, than people have immune systems. They have uh, conditions that favor their growth and their thriving and, and growing and reproducing. And then they have conditions that stress them out. Plants can become stressed. And, uh, and can impact whether or not we have disease occur and how severe that disease is when it does occur. So we have to think about the plant and how well it's being treated, the environment, and how conducive is it to disease, and then what pathogens do we have present. And when we think about those three things in tandem all together, uh, we can start to identify areas that we can manipulate and reduce the size of that triangle that occurs to reduce the likelihood of disease occurring and that disease becoming severe enough to, for instance, cause our lawn to go poor, our ornamental plants to die, or our blueberries not to produce uh, not to produce fruit. So maybe that's a that's a starting point that we can uh, jump off from from there. Uh, and thinking about the, the the plant diseases are sort of the exception to the rule. Uh, when they occur, we have certain management options that we can employ, uh, but we have to um, uh, you know determine if if a plant symptom is due to disease or not before we can come up with the appropriate and most effective and efficient management options to employ to make the, so make the problem better versus making it worse. That's what we want to try to avoid for sure. Well, that's the, thank you. That's a perfect, you know, lead into the next question I wanted to ask, right? So we sometimes see problems with our plants and there's diseases. Uh, we've you know, maybe we'll talk about abiotic factors, right? There's the string trimmers and the just taking poor care of your plants that make them look sad sometimes. But when we have these poor looking plants, uh, how do we know for sure? You know, we can call our extension agent and ask questions, but how do we know exactly for sure that we have a disease or a pathogen that's affecting our plant? Yeah, that's, that's a critical first step in trying to determine what are we going to do about this problem is determining what is the nature of the problem that we're seeing. The plants can be sick, they can look like they're dying, but they can be dying for, for many different reasons. In the case of disease, uh, it's important for us to get a, a diagnosis. Even as a plant pathologist that's been doing this uh, 20 years plus, 18 in Florida, I can't look at plants that are sick or dying and tell you if it's disease and which disease it, it is in many cases. Some cases we have diseases that occur on the same plants each year around the same time, 
and have distinct symptoms that we can make a pretty good guess. In other cases, it's never, it's, it's almost never one thing. And we may have a disease, we may have an unfavorable environment. And so what we do is take a sample of that plant and send it to a lab. At, in Gainesville, we have the, the hub lab for the Southeast United States. Uh, we receive about uh, three to 4,000 samples per year. We plate those samples in the lab, look at them with microscopes, do tests with ELISA and other uh, diagnostic tests that uh, can identify pathogens, associate those pathogens with symptoms that, are, that we know can be produced by them on the plants of interest. And that's when we make a diagnosis and, uh, and then offer our uh, best management practices or our option for, for uh, what to do about that, that disease. And, uh, and so there are other labs around the state. The Florida Plant Diagnostic Network has labs in Quincy. We have labs down in, in uh, Homestead uh, and throughout the state in Baum. Here in Gainesville, we do a lot of blueberries and, and turf samples. Um, and uh, there's, there's probably a clinic near you, uh, you know, for, for submitting your samples too. So that's yeah, we're, it. We're, we're lucky here in the Panhandle, since we're talking gardening in the Panhandle, we're lucky to have the Quincy Center, uh, which yeah. I'm right down the road from. So Dr. Fanny Iriarte, she's great. And Dr. Matthews Parrott, they run the lab there. Uh, Fanny's usually the one that you drop the samples off to, which she can be very much, very helpful in again, diagnosing exactly what it is to get you the best control method. So, uh, and then one more question before I get to the Zoom questions is an easy yes or no, Dr. Harmon. Are all, right. all fungi and bacteria bad? No, most fungi and bacteria are good, especially ones you put on pizza, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I just had pizza today, actually. Um, all right, let's get to some of these questions that people wrote in. Uh, let's see. And this one, this one is going to be for you, Larry. Okay, get ready, Larry. So are there diseases that are caused by pests that, you know, are, I think the, the question what they're trying to get out here is, are there just broad things you just spray all over the place to stop disease? Or do you really need to be specific to particular, uh, is it say, maybe it's your lawn, maybe it's some ornamentals? Um, is, are the diseases that kind of specific where you need special treatment for each one, or can you just kind of broadcast something across the whole thing? Well, thank you. And that's somewhat of a yes or no uh, question or answer. <clears throat> there is this concept, and I think it's an important concept of uh, key plant, key pest. There are certain plants that we plant that you plant everything that goes with that plant. And here in the Southeast, with it being a wet environment, which is perfect for a lot of these fungal organisms, you, when you plant um, roses, for example, and there are some that have you know, better resistance and so on, but uh, especially some of the hybrid tea roses, some of those that are very susceptible that might do well or better in a drier climate, like in the Midwest or California, you place that same plant in the Southeast under, under our wet conditions. And now you have this key plant, key pest problem with uh, a common disease, uh, black spot, you know, rose that goes hand in hand. So there are some rose enthusiasts that if you're gonna grow certain types of roses here in Florida, you, you need to be on a good spray program of, uh, with, for uh, fungal diseases. And, and other pests. So it, it is dependent on what you're trying to grow and, and trying to pick the, the right plant for the right place, essentially. But when you think about Indian hawthorn, which is a common plant here, entomosporium leaf spot goes hand in hand with that. And there's other plants that are susceptible to that fungal disease, but um, all of the, in, in my area here in Northwest Florida, all of the uh, Indian hawthorns look pretty bad or sad right now. We went through all that rain and fall by dry weather of most of May. And uh, there's a lot of the leaves on that evergreen plant that's turned orange, reddish orange. And if you look close, they have spots and they're beginning to fall from the plant. Um, that's an example of one that if you have it in your landscape, you may have to spray a little more, more often, especially associated with wet conditions from rain. Then you have the uh, gray leaf spot on St. Augustine grass. I think there probably are other grasses that may be susceptible, but if you plant a St. Augustine grass lawn here 
in Florida, you will eventually have to deal with gray leaf spot. Then there's other fungal organisms that are more uh, uh, just general. They, they'll, they, they're not as specific. They'll, you know, be as happy if you want to use that word on, on a wide range of plants. I don't think we need to get into the mistake of um, without knowing what you're doing of routinely spraying any pesticide on a regular basis because you can get into resistance, you can cause you know, other problems. So that's that's kind of the answer is it's a yes and no, um, know your plants. And if you do plant one of those that, that happens to have a higher degree of requirements with maintenance, especially uh, for diseases, you, you do have to do more treatment and spraying and, and other management um, things that you can you know, manage the diseases. Yeah, so it sounds like there, you, uh, there are there's some specific things you need to know whether you're dealing with a certain type of lawn or certain shrubs. And the best thing is to find out, you know, and there's a whole lot of plant fact sheets that IFAS has put together. So you can look up St. Augustine grass and University of Florida and it'll tell you, you know, here's what you got to look for on St. Augustine grass. And so if you have St. Augustine grass, you need to be on the lookout for those things and yeah. be preventative, right? Okay. Mark, one other thing, if, you know, people don't think about this sometimes and it, it may be laughable, but when, when you look at that triangle, the plant, you know, pathology triangle, or you think of it as a three-legged stool, uh, if you eliminate the host plant, if you get tired of it and you just don't want to put all that money and time into it, I used to love to grow peaches. I'm from Georgia originally, but I, I won't do that now because I'm not willing to do to be on such a spray program to control diseases on that that plant here. So you, if, if you reach a point where you don't want to have to deal with it, one option is to take a look at the plant and maybe eliminate it and pick something else out that doesn't require as much spraying. Yeah, yeah, good, good, uh, good tip there, Larry. Let's see, we're gonna move, I think, Stephen, I'm gonna jump to you and ask, uh, and Dr. Harmon spoke about this a little bit, but kind of in that preventative mode of, you know, what can you do to help keep these plants disease free? What are some of our options? I think we're going to hear really a common theme as we run through the day, I suspect. But because uh, I'm, I'm going to hit on some similar things that, that Dr. Harmon's hit and several others. But, you know, uh, you, if, if you haven't looked at it, take a chance to look at the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide. It really goes through a lot of this same detail. Um, you know, for years, um, I had master gardeners that loved to shop the deals. And this was when I was in North Carolina for looking for that half dead plant and they were only paying 25%, but I'd looked at them and said, it's 25% of not much, you know, and what are you bringing into your setting with all those other potentially healthy plants you have? And that some just couldn't help themselves. A deal was a deal, but it's not a deal. It's hard to resist those piles. I know. <laughs> yes. So really, you, you have to really, the um, first thing uh, I typically talk to people about is look at your site. What situation are you in? Is it full sun? Is it partial shade? Do you have high shade, low shade? Is it intermittent where you're breaking uh, those different light levels? Um, you know, is it selecting that plant that works well for that area? Understanding your soil and soil types. Does it drain well? Or you're in an edge of a wetland where you're going to have performance issues if it's the wrong plant in there. And, you know, it, it gives that potential for diseases to really establish, get that foothold and really make a run for it. And so a lot of times when we see some of these um, pests like this, some of these disease issues, has it already, in the old fashioned way, has it already left the barn too far? where you can kind of check it back a little bit. And sometimes um, you have to look at as landscape as a, a living, changing thing. And sometimes you have to make that directional change and go another way. And that kind of hits where Larry was talking about with some of the lawns and lawn challenges and things. Uh, believe me, I had a challenge with the gray leaf with St. Augustine. And that, that definitely, that was not fun, I guess is the best way to win? put it. I'm did sorry? You did you win the battle? Um, I did by replacing and doing something different. <laughs> all right. So you took Larry's advice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you know, right. looking at you also talking about fertilizers and the appropriateness of how you fertilize, when you fertilize and understanding those pieces that go along with the soil test and understanding where your pH is and is it ideal situation to help that plant continue that strong root growth that helps the rest of the plant go. I guess I'll stop yeah. there. Right plant, right place. Good cultural practices, 
Yes. It looks fucking healthy, right? Yes, it does. Okay, Mr. Orwat, I'm going to ask you a very specific question relating okay. to control of plant disease. And this has to Sounds do good. with powdery mildew. So if you got crepe myrtles, <clears throat> there's a good <clears throat> there's a good chance that right now you have some powdery mildew on them. Now, so is one, neem oil the best? Yes, some folks want to know is neem oil your best bet for controlling powdery mildew? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, you know, when anyone tries to tell somebody that it's the if something's the best, they're probably not telling you the truth, okay? <laughs> because it depends on the situation. My favorite answer as a horticulturist is it depends. So, so yeah, so with, with neem oil, it, 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 you know, depending on which uh, species you're working with, it can be a good option if the disease pressure is moderate, okay? Uh, powdery mildew is caused by a uh, warm day, well, it's caused by a fungal organism, but it, ta it takes place in, in, during warm days and cool nights. And it tends to, this time of year, it affects different species at different times. So earlier in the year, I had a lot of effect on roses, but now that's kind of stopped. And now I'm starting to see it on crepe myrtle and squash. And I didn't see, see it on squash earlier. So um, neem oil can work if there's kind of low to moderate disease pressure, but in heavy disease pressure, neem oil probably won't cure your plant or, or prevent powdery mildew 100%. And the other factor with neem oil is if you overuse it or use it when temperatures are too warm, you can burn the plant, so you have to be careful. Um, the, the other thing is um, once the temperatures get really hot, the powdery mildew will not be occurring because the plant, because the fungus powdery mildew cannot reproduce itself in extremely hot temperatures. So once we start hitting the the, the mid 90s consistently, the powdery mildew shouldn't be a problem anymore. Uh, there are uh, several options you can do to control powdery mildew with neem oil being one of them, but you can also plant powdery mildew resistant crepe myrtles, okay? Pow powdery mildew resistant roses um, and some other plants. Another thing you can try, there are some other fungicides on the market and I, I posted a, a link from Clemson that has a good list of homeowner, uh, fungicides that homeowners could purchase to treat powdery mildew on a systemic basis and a contact basis. Uh, some of the most popular being chlorothalonil, um, propiconazole, uh, also uh, the old fashioned copper, copper sprays um, can work on powdery mildew. Um, oftentimes you don't see it for sale anymore, but uh, there's some good recipes that UC Davis has to make your own fungicides. You can make your own Bordeaux mixture. And that's from UC Davis Extension, UC, University of California. They have a recipe on there that's approved to be made uh, for homeowners to make um, uh, if they want to make their own Bordeaux mixture. Um, but with copper, you have to be careful because you, you don't want to um, overuse it because it can build up in the soil. So there are lots of factors. You need to follow the label instructions when you use fungicides. And, and I'm a fan of trying to like everyone else has said, plant the right plant in the right place. So if you can plant a resistant crepe myrtle that's resistant to powdery mildew, you'd be doing, doing the best thing. All right, thank you, sir. And maybe we have time at the end, we'll, we'll get the story maybe from Dr. Harmon on the history of Bordeaux mix. I think it's a cool story, but uh, let's see. I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna stick with you, Matt, and let's see, okay. we're gonna move into, uh, we have several questions that we've grouped based on you know ornamentals or turf uh, related. And so this one's ornamentals and it has to do with citrus. So someone has a citrus tree that has black stuff on the leaves black and stuff. fruit. So is this okay. a disease and what do they need to do about it? Well, the answer, well, let's put it this way. If it's on the leaves and the fruit, both, it is a fungus, but it's not a disease, okay? Right. Uh, it, right. is, it is, it, it's most likely sooty mold, okay? That, uh, if you have a citrus tree where a lot of scale insects, white flies or uh, aphids are feeding upon, they will create a sugary substance that they exude as a waste product and it's called honeydew. And that will be a sticky substance on the leaves. And in the summertime and when we're humid, that substance will grow a fungus called sooty mold. And that can coat the leaves and the fruit of citrus. To determine if it's sooty mold, it can be something that can be easily washed off 
especially if you have a, a, a forceful stream of water or a, and a sponge, or even a, you can even try a little bit of, of uh, a solution of water in a light rubbing alcohol to, to wash it off. And it tends to be uh, caused by uh, insects, mostly scale and aphid. You can control the scale and aphid insects by using a, um, a horticultural oil or a insecticidal soap but you have to make sure to spray the underside of the leaves because that's where they're living on the on the underside of the leaves and the new growth that's most likely your issue now if you're having a blackish substance that really only occurs on the fruit it could be the result of feeding by the citrus rust mite okay and that would be a whole nother situation where you'd have to work to control those citrus rust mites but it would, it would not appear on the le leaves, it would only appear in the fruit and it would be bronzy, blackish brown color. So what you likely have, if it's on the leaves and the fruit and it's a pure black color, you're looking at sooty mold. And that should be controlled by management of feeding insects that cause honeydew. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, I think we had a couple of questions really on, you know, what is this black stuff all over my leaves? And right, sooty mold is probably the answer. Sooty mold. Uh, let's see, Stephen. I'm going to ask Stephen a question here on, are there any combinations of plants uh, that can help synergistically somehow reduce your disease pressure? You got any magic information for us, Stephen? Asphalt. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but no, it, it, there's not a magic wand or a magic plant mix that'll solve a lot of those and what what you have to look at is a lot of diseases are constantly in a mutating version they're they're changing and so that's why we kind of have to stay ahead of the game a little bit not just culturally but also in some of the other practices in breeding and the other things we do with plant material but you know i hate to keep going back to it but i'm such an advocate of spending that time and that energy and a little bit of extra dollars on the soil site before you start anything. You've, you've got to get the organics right in it and look at the pH and looking at the drainage and, you know, do you address some of the nutrient needs or if there are some, which typically in sandier soils or some of the clay soils as you get near Alabama, there are some things that um, you, you do need to address. Um, one thing I will say with clay soils, it's a bit more forgiving if you missed the mark a little bit. There's a little bit more buffer in there, which is a very advantageous thing to have. Um, but, you know, you, you want to get that, I call it the soil web, right? You know, with the fungi and the bacteria and some of the other organisms all the way down to some of the beneficial nematodes and things and breaking down a lot of those materials that you've added in there to make it an enriched soil that the plants have a chance to really get the roots right and get established and keeping that more and more soil moisture consistent. Now we do deal with more of a um, more epiphytic or epiphytic type plants, depending on who you're talking to. Those, that's where you've got one plant. Let's just say it's an oak tree and it's growing well there and you wind up with a bromelid up in it. Well, the bromelid is not really harming the plant any, but it's receiving a benefit from the tree. Um, so is it doing some things for you? Sure, it's creating an environment where Wildlife can establish, gosh, we all love lizards, right? Uh, there's no lizards around here. <laughs> but, um, you know, so, you know, when you're looking at some of the true mosses that grow, lichens uh, that are on some of the trees in the wintertime, the deer may feed a little bit off of it. And so, and then they give you a deposit beside the tree for a little bit of extra nutrient growth next year. Organic matter. Yes. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, if you look at it from that perspective, um, they're, they, plant material and wildlife and everything else going on out there do benefit each other. But I can't say, unless you guys have got something you want to add to it, that I've really found that there's a, these specific plants, if you join together and tree and shrub and grow, no, it's more about does, does a certain plant need a deeper root system to grow into some of the sandier soils? Is it more of a, a lateral feeding root system? We all know that from hurricanes um, on some of the plant selection. So I, I guess I'll leave it at that. Yeah. One thing I can add is if you have a, you can use rootstocks for certain tree, tree and shrub species that are adapted yep. to your soil. Yep. So Agreed. make sure you're using an adapted rootstock. That's a, if, that's if, a, if needed. Yeah, that's a good uh, answer there, Orwat, because say like our citrus, a lot of them we graft onto a different rootstock, right? And some of that is for disease resistance. So that's a combination of two different plants in a sort of way. So yeah, 
Like Matthew Orway, always thinking out of the box. Let me tell Let you. Let me ask you a little bit of this piece. Mycorrhizal, how do you how do you guys feel about that? I think they're great, but I'll let Dr. Harmon talk about mycorrhizae. Yeah, mycorrhizae are, are a very important beneficial fungi that associate with plants and, and they have benefits that include making nutrients available, collecting nutrients for the plants that they're associated with. They also, uh, we're learning more about how they interact with the microbiome, the other organisms that live in the soil, including pathogens. And so having a healthy ecosystem of microorganisms in the soil associated with the plants is a good defense, almost like an immune defense for, for plants and can help to, to prevent disease from becoming you know, very, very problematic. So mycorrhizae are, are a good example mm -hmm. of beneficial fungi and, and ones that are critically important for us for growing plants. Okay, I'm gonna lead in, sorry. I'm gonna lead in with another question here. When you get down <laughs> wait, there, wait, wait, who's asking questions <laughs> here? Go ahead, Steven. No, just um, leading up to that, you know, we use that and we did a lot of tree transplants and things and when I was in, in community development. But when we moved down near coastal areas, it was so sandy, so little organics and things. What would you suggest about how to enhance that site to help that growth? Dr. Harmon? So, so the, um, the sandy sugar sand soils, they need organic matter. And, yes. you know, they need composted mulch. They need uh, some other type of organic matter for those microorganisms that are beneficial to live on. And, uh, and, and we also need to, as was mentioned, you know, be, be thinking about what kinds of sands are we talking about? Are these calcareous sands? Are they high pH? And what are the requirements of the plants we're trying to grow? If it's turf grass, you know, um, and they're going to need a certain pH range for de depending on the species you select. If it's an ornamental plant, you're going to have different requirements. And, and uh, in general, a sugar sand sort of hydroponic growth attempt is going to be much more difficult to manage and maintain good quality uh, plant than something with a balanced good soil with a lot of uh, or you know appropriate amount of organic matter and, and beneficial microorganisms. Yeah. So choose the right plant for the bright place and work on your soil microbes. Yeah. But Mark, I'll let you get back on focus. Sorry about hijacking <laughs> that for a second. <laughs> no problem. No problem. We're going to put you down as a contact down here. Um, Larry, Larry, someone calls and said, hey, I got some ornamental plants. They got brown spots on them. You know, what can I do? Welcome to Florida and move to a drier climate. <laughs> um, like we said earlier, you know, there, there are some plants that um, are more prone or whatever to diseases. You need to know that up front. Am I, am I dealing with uh, a plant that just routinely is going to be bothered by diseases? But there are a lot of leaf spot diseases that we, we have to deal with. And sometimes we get too worried about those. I'll use an example, <clears throat> hydrangea. Good luck uh, later in the season. If you have a hydrangea anywhere here, e even our native hydrangeas, the oak, le oak leaf hydrangea, I would challenge you to go out in the wild and find one that is blemish free. It's just, it goes hand in hand. It's, <clears throat> the plant doesn't know it's diseased. I don't, I don't suppose it, it, but it does lead to, if we have a wet year, particularly if it's the you know frequent late afternoon, evening showers, just day after day, um, that kind of that 12 to 14 hour interval of uninterrupted wetness. We don't want to create that for ourselves by watering at the wrong time. People that water routinely late in the day, their, their irrigation systems coming on or they're watering their vegetable garden by hand uh, in the evening or, or you know, right after uh, just early dark time in that range. Well, the plants are not going to dry out. So you're providing that perfect environment for foliage diseases, leaf spot diseases to develop. But if, you're, if you really want to have, uh, say a hydrangea again, as an example, that has um, fewer leaf spots, you have to be willing to spray on a regular basis to, uh, as a preventative measure, always follow directions on the product. And, and these products don't last forever. A lot of those pro uh, fungicides will tell you to spray every seven to 14 days, for example, under favorable disease development you know, conditions. And um, if you're willing to do that and you do it correctly, follow directions on the label, you might keep the foliage cleaner longer, 
And it, your hydrangeas, and I'm, I'm again using that as an example, as we get into late summer and fall may look better than your neighbors, but you have to ask, is it worth it? And um, it, it, the, in most cases, if you're managing the plant correctly, those diseases are not going to kill the plant, those foliage diseases. There are exceptions if you're dealing with, you know, some annuals and in your vegetable garden, um, various you know, early blight and uh, septoria leaf spot on tomato, for example, you, you get better production and, and may get uh, the benefit of harvesting tomatoes longer in the season if you're willing to spray. But diseases come with our territory and you have to do your homework, check in with the master gardener, with uh, the, your extension office through an extension agent. Um, if we need to send a sample in, we've got uh, the wonderful resources like Dr. Harmon and plant pathology labs to do that. But um, don't spray if you're playing a guessing game. Um, but realize that you do live in a favorable environment for leaf spot diseases. I hope that answered it. It's, um, it's just, uh, mm -hmm. I have hydrangeas and other plants I don't bother with too much. I just, I let it run its course. It kind of goes back to your earlier answer, right? Or, and Stevens and Dr. Harmon's right plant, right place and learn the plant that you're growing. This, for instance, hydrangeas, which are famous for their leaf spots uh, and figure out what tends to attack them and how can you prevent them. Uh, I'm gonna jump to Dr. Harmon. So uh, we'll, we'll do one more on ornamentals and then we'll make sure we get some turf disease questions in as well. So we have a question here about mushroom root rot. So mushroom root rot, kind of what is it and what can we do to control this particular fungal disease? Yeah, so mushroom root rot is, is fairly common and can be a really problematic disease for landscapes in, in Florida. Um, it is caused by a fungus called armillaria and uh, also known as the honey mushroom fungus. So this, this is a fungus that grows through the soil, through the organic, spreads from plant to plant, has a fairly wide host range of woody plants um, that it can kill. And uh, as it colonizes the crowns, it will feed off the plant, it will kill the plant, and then you'll see these crops of, of orange to honey-colored mushrooms that come out in the, in the summer and fall. So um, it, it is problematic because it can kill some of those prized specimen woodies that we have. And it does have, as I mentioned, that, that wide host range where it can jump from plant to plant, which is fairly unusual. Most of our diseases are fairly limited to related plants or a small number of plants. This one has dozens of plants on the host range. So, um, you know, where it occurs, we need to uh, think about changing, as, as Larry had mentioned, changing our, our um, uh, sort of tact. We need to go in and look up in the Armillaria Root Rot Edis publication and other resources. What are some of the uh, resistant plants that we can use in a similar fashion to some of the shrubs or trees that are dying? And, uh, and really alter the landscape because for this particular disease, the fungicides uh, don't work. We have some other cultural management uh, attempts that we can make to aerate soil and to expose crowns. We can, we can follow some of those guidelines in the EDIS publication about um, you know, making sure the plant is happy, it's not uh, being stressed unnecessarily, uh, and, then, and then kind of move on from there uh, after we have that diagnosis and know what it is know what we can go in and expect and then use to replant uh, where those where those plants have, have died. Yeah, I often see those honeypot mushrooms next to an old stump. And if someone's planted a hedge, like some viburnums, for instance, along next to that stump, those are usually the first ones to get that uh, that root rot. Mark, I, I just, I, I stay frustrated, to be honest, with, with our malaria, mushroom root rot in my landscape. I live in a a little bit of an older neighborhood and a lot of oaks over the years have come out mostly during storm events. So there's a lot of big roots from those oaks left in the ground as they decay. Our malaria is only doing what it's supposed to do in nature, help kind of break that down and take that, um, you know, decompose that wood. But in the process, it takes out some of my plants. Speaking of roses, Matt, um, I'll get probably six, seven, eight years out of a rose plant before our malaria begins to to take it out. And um, there's other plants that seem to be susceptible. It's frustrating. Are you using Rosa Fortuniana rootstock? 
I, I want to investigate on the, on that one. I I wondered if if Fortuniana rootstock would be um, less problematic, but I need to I need to try that it's, one. It, it tends to be more resistant to fungal and nematodes. I don't know about our malaria, but I don't think it's ever been tested with our malaria. But it uh, it tends to it's definitely nematode resistant and and uh, resistant to other fungal root rots. Um, it also uh, is resistant to heat stress. And the species Fortuniana is immune to black spot that the leaves are. So um, the root part, the part that's underground, I don't know if that might give some qualities to the scion, you know, to give resistance. I don't, uh, there hadn't been enough work to look into that, but in general, it, it, it's not, it's a rootstock that does not require dormancy to function. So it is already coming into a better position in the spring than uh, roses grafted on any other rootstock. So you see how Mr. Orwat got roses into the discussion here? We didn't have a, a well, Larry brought it up. question. So <laughs> Matt just worked it right in there. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Larry, Matt, thank you. Matt. Th th and thank you, Larry, for helping me. <laughs> we had a plot. We had a behind the scenes plot. Yeah, I figured. Matt, can you, let's get into turf and uh, different turf diseases. Are there different diseases that affect the different turf species? So say, are there... Are there diseases that are more going to be problematic in St. Augustine versus centipede? Do we have to really, like Larry said earlier, we got to really know our different turf grasses, or is there just a bunch that we got to worry about in general? Oh, you're muted, Matt. Sorry. Large patch, which was large patch, which is previously known as brown patch, tends to work badly both on St. Augustine and centipede and zoysia grass. So you can have uh, some diseases that are more prevalent on um, several species, but with take all root rot, you'll mostly see that on centipede grass. However, you can also see it on St. Augustine grass. Um, gray leaf spot can be on centipede or St. Augustine. Bahia grass, you don't see too many problematic diseases, but they can be susceptible to uh, mole cricket or just weed in intrusion because they're thinner, uh, thinner growing. So you, you basically, there are some commonalities there, but there are also some differences okay, with what so you're growing. Um, back, to, back to knowing the details. Knowing your turf way. grass. Yep, right. Yep. And fertilization, like Stephen mentioned this earlier, and I wanted to hit on it uh, again, is that managing fertilization or fertility rates, nutrient rates for centipede grass is extremely crucial because excessive nutrient uh, load in the soil, nitrogen load in the soil, uh, has been proven to exacerbate uh, fungal rots in centipede grass. So you really need to pay close attention to the IFAS recommendations on using nitrogen on centipede grass. Be very, as you know, the soil tests do not test for nitrogen. So you need to follow those recommendations and uh, very closely if, right, if you're Matt. going to fertilize for centipede. And the latest centipede recommendation is almost next to nothing. It's like, uh, you know, the low range is right. less than half a pound. And, and it really depends on your soil. If you have a real sugar sandy soil with no nutrients, you may need to apply a slow release fertilizer to your centipede. Or uh, I prefer a, a fertilizer based on organic matter, uh, you know, that, that, is a, 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 that can slow release and also add organic matter. But you, you never do want to put like a, some people want to put out a 20, 20, 20. Well, if you do that, you're guaranteed to harm your centipede grass. Um, and if you do want to fertilize your centipede, you need to spoon feed it and s fertilize it in small increments and not dump it all at once. So pay attention to centipede because you can have a beautiful centipede lawn. But if you over fertilize, you can really ruin it in a hurry. Uh, just go ahead and mention the timing of those applications too. That, that Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Um, or mid April would be your first one. Okay. You, depending on the weather. So if it's, if we have a really warm spring, you can do it in early April um, in, in the panhandle, but wait till they're actively growing first of all, because if you don't, it'll just be wasted and leach down into the groundwater. Um, you could do another application in, in around June and then in August and that's it. Um, you don't, you don't want to do any more. Uh, so, so, so the, the literature says September, early September would be your cutoff, but only fertilize if the, the grass, if it's growing healthy and, and, and you're mowing your mulch mowing, 
you may not need to fertilize at all, or maybe just every few years, uh, especially if you have a established turf grass and you're mulch mowing regularly. I have never fertilized my centipede grass and it's always green. So <laughs> same here, man. Yeah. So uh, all right, Doc, Dr. Harmon, what about when we get mushrooms that pop up in the grass, in the lawn? Are those damaging to the lawn? Uh, do we need to worry about them as far as the turf health? Yeah, good, good question. I get a lot of questions about mushrooms and some of those uh, are more the cap and stock sort of standard mushroom. Sometimes we get slime molds and bug vomit fungus and other uh, interesting things. But for mushrooms specifically, the, you know, the first question I get is, can I eat these? And <laughs> the, the answer is sure you can, but it might kill you. Don't do yeah. it. At and least once. Like, yeah, any of them are edible, but but only once, right? They, they, they really have the potential to be toxic. And so uh, don't eat mushrooms out of your yard. Those mushrooms can be there from our malaria. They can be there from other uh, organisms that are breaking down that leaf material that we're mulching back into the soil uh, from buried wood. Um, there is a mushroom uh, associated disease of turf grass called fairy ring. Um, you know, my kids think it's really cool to see the rings of mushrooms growing in lawns and, and they love them. Other people get concerned uh, because of the appearance or because they're afraid, you know, that their, their pets or their children might, might eat the mushrooms. Um, uh, I, I happen to like fairy ring, but, but th that's a, a disease that, uh, that occurs in turf where we do get mushrooms associated with it. All the other fungal diseases uh, really produce microscopic sorts of, of um, parts of the fungus that we don't see. So we can have fairy ring, that, that'll be characteristic um, in that you'll see a stimulated ring of green grass where it's growing more rapidly than the surrounding grass. Uh, and that's because the fungus is actually releasing nitrogen from organic matter as it grows through. Uh, where it can become problematic, more problematic is when we have drought stress and that fungus also coats the sand particles with the mucilage that, that makes the soil hydrophobic, meaning water repellent. So that ring can dry out and causes some, some dead, uh, dead turf and then mushrooms will come up at the next ring around it. So mushrooms are common. In most cases, I say don't, don't worry about them. You know, they're, they're generally good things to see. Uh, and um, where you have concerns, you can get rid of them simply by mowing them or picking them, throwing them in, in the trash and getting rid of them. Um, and don't eat them. <laughs> I, I also like seeing fairy rings in yards, and there's probably several pictures on my phone of fairy rings in someone's yard. Uh, I'm going to stick with you, Dr. Harmon. We've mentioned, let's see, we mentioned uh, Orwat went over a lot of the fungal regular old diseases, or Larry did, you know, gray leaf spot, large patch, take all root rot. So there are products to help control these things, help slow them down. We, of course, want to do our good cultural practices. But are there any kind of natural or what we would consider organic methods for controlling some of these turf fungal diseases? Yeah, that's a that's a goal for research. It's uh, one that we'd love to be able to employ successfully to take a, a biological organism and put it out, create that healthy microbiome in the soil and prevent disease. Um, there has been some success in other crops. But most of all of the products that are biological in nature that I've tested uh, for turf grass in my research have not given anywhere near the, the level of efficacy that we can expect out of a chemical fungicide uh, for diseases that we're trying to control. Now, uh, they're not gonna hurt anything. I've never seen one that, that does uh, any damage either. So uh, there's something that we can try. And in some years, in very specific instances, it can help to reduce our disease severity when disease pressure is, is low. Uh, but for the most part, if we're trying to prevent disease and we have a disease problem that's, that's chronic, that reappears year after year, like large patch or take all root rot, uh, we're going to be reaching for a chemical fungicide. In most cases, we're going to be you know, trying to get a professional to, to make that application, although there are some good products available for homeowners as well. Uh, so um, yeah, we can use those. We have to have limited expectations, realistic expectations for what the biological products can do and then fall back on in these areas where we, we can't tolerate the damage and we want to prevent them onto the chemical fungicides uh, that, uh, that these days are, are very selective, they're very effective, they're somewhat expensive, so we want to be, be sure we're, we know what we're treating and why we're treating uh, and then move forward from there. Oh, uh, Dr. Harmon, let me, let me ask one quick question in relation to that. Uh, if 
if uh, I've heard a lot of uh, people when they talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, synthetic fungicides, if it, will they have any harmful effect on a soil microbiome like mycorrhiza or any of that stuff? There's been a lot of information out there and that question gets uh, thrown around a lot. I'd like to hear what you think on that. Yeah, good, good question. So there, there are extremes here that we can talk about where, where we know and we have data to, to show what happens. Uh, if we use uh, something like a methyl bromide fumigation where we kill all the microorganisms in the soil, we set things back as far as plant growth and health um, a, a long way, a long distance. So we want to try to prevent that. We want to try to prevent widely toxic uh, generalist sort of compounds being applied in bulk and in multiple applications because those can disrupt our healthy microbiome. Those can, can cause more problems than they solve. Uh, modern fungicides that we use today um, and in particular are, are approved for residential home lawns are of lower toxicity and higher selectivity than those that were used in the past. So they can be very efficacious, do a great job. And there has been limited research on the uh, impacts of those products on fungal microbiome. I have a PhD student now looking at a, a weedy grass and the microbiome impacts of fungicides that have never been used before, looking at this. And it does shift the organisms that we can find in and on plants when we use these fungicides. But those microbiomes are fairly resilient. They bounce back. And uh, overall, we see a reduction in disease severity and disease occurrence. And we see a benefit to the turf plant without major negative benefits to our, our, uh, our microbiome and our, our good microbes. Very, Thank very you for that answer. Thank you. Because there's so much misinformation out there. And I, I'd like to be able to address that in a really well-educated way. So you've, you've helped me, you say you have a PhD student looking at it, so I can find a lot more information now that you pointed me in the right direction. Thank you. Yeah, it'd be yeah very cool. For, for, for the listeners out there, if you have, uh, you know, children, grandchildren, relatives that are looking to get into uh, biological sciences, I think if I had a, a second round, you know, going into the soil microbiome and all the cool work that's being done, uh, it's a really, really fascinating field of research, I think. Uh, let's see, there is a question here on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Stephen a question here. So Stephen, uh, I think Orwat mentioned centipede grass decline. Um, how, what can we do about centipede grass decline, Stephen? Um, Plant St. Augustine grass? <laughs> well, when you're looking at decline, it, it comes down to what's really going on, what, what's triggering it. As Matt mentioned, we're, we tend to over-irrigate, over-fertilize, over-stimulate, and it opens a window for so many different things we have, especially in centipede. Centipede, when I grew up as a kid, we called it poor man's grass, and there was a reason for calling it that. You know, you didn't have to do a whole lot for it. When it would get dry, it would go into that gray look and go dormant and wait. Um, wait for mother nature to bring in a little bit of irrigation into it. Sometimes we push grasses a little too hard. And I, I will tell you, I, I came through in the turf grass side in, in college. I was in the golf course business, uh, managed several sod farms and things. And yeah, I had one gentleman who loved to put out ammonium nitrate on centipede to push it just before harvest. And I tried, tried, and tried to talk him out of doing that. Um, it looks great and really nice green color, but that's not the natural color of that grass. So um, there, there, you will have some ground pearls and some other things go on and occur in the, the settings with the centipede lawns. And um, gosh, I've actually recreated some lawn areas where I had a nice landscape stand square and sweeping through a part of the lawn and made two different room areas out there in the landscape with the centipede with the new established landscape. Um, there, are, there are ways of addressing it without gosh, repeating it over and over and over and getting frustrated. Um, um, once you get certain pathogens established to a certain level in, in settings, it's, and it's year after year after year, that's a very frustrating thing to deal with. I don't think I really fully answered that, but I like to kind of work my way around it, I guess is the best way. And um, the, the timing of irrigation, critical. Gosh, that, that late afternoon, early evening, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, easy to go over and punch the button or turn on the sprinkler with the hose and let it run. That's, that's not the ideal time. Very early morning hours, that four o'clock to shut off just before sunrise time period is more ideal. Okay, thank you. Yeah. A lot of the similar, you know, take good care of your plants. 
water them well, fertilize them properly, and hope that, you know reduce some of these these problems. I got it. We got a couple more questions, and we're but we're getting close to quitting time here. So I do. Uh, let's see. Julie put a link in the chat for a survey. So for those of you that may need to take off shortly, uh, please click the link to this Qualtrics survey and let us know how we did. Uh, if you learned anything, if you're going to use any of the information, we'd love to know. Uh, Larry, this is a little, you know, uh, Stephen was just talking about these, these areas that are rough with centipede grass. Uh, one of our listeners is having an issue with St. Augustine grass and brown patch every year in the same spot. So are they doing something wrong? You know, what, what can they do to try to turn that around? Well, first they need to find out, <clears throat> and, you know, what's, what the cause is if possible and uh, either confirm or rule out disease as, you know, the problem. And again, you can check with your local extension office in, in your county and we can get you uh, going in the right direction on submitting how to submit and the, the the right way, the, taking a good sample and, and getting it to the lab to see if there is a uh, disease organism associated with, with those brown areas. <clears throat> but it could be sometimes even where an old tree was removed and, and the, the roots uh, and the, the stump, you know, underground um, decompose very slowly and, and that can have uh, some impacts that can last and linger for years. But if it is something like rhizoctonia, which is, I believe, Dr. Uh, Harmon, I, I believe, if I understand correctly, it, it would be considered a native fungus. It's here for a purpose, but uh, it, can, it can negatively impact our, our lawn. So uh, if, if it is rhizoctonia that causes large patch, look at your management practices. It can stay in the soil. Unlike the foliage diseases, leaf spot diseases, this this is in the soil and can, that colony, that fungal colony can be there for years. And uh, it may take multiple years of uh, treatment and, and good management, e even, even looking at uh, soil compaction and, and getting air and water to move through. Uh, you know, you, it may take uh, getting uh, an extension agent or uh, if that's not possible, a, a reputable a lawn care you know, service that uh, can, can take a look so sending a sample in if necessary, determining if, if an old tree root was there, tree was there years ago. Um, I've even seen things like debris underneath the soil uh, that's covered over, especially with new construction, where they left uh, concrete and who knows what, just under the surface, doing some probing, digging to see if that's the case. So there's not uh, a absolute answer on that one. Uh, I would start with finding out what the cause is. And we can help you with that. Okay, thank you, Larry. I was trying to check in on another uh, question here. Um, let's see, I'm gonna answer one of these live ones here from the group. And Dr. Harmon, maybe I'll throw this random question out to you. So are, uh, are mixed varieties of turf grass, like say, maybe various mixtures of St. Augustine grass. Is this something that can help lower disease pressure? Ooh, man, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah, uh, we have to be a little bit careful with turf grass in Florida because we have such a wide range of, of textures and, and leaf uh, sizes and that impacts you know, how high we mow and how we uh, treat the turf as far as fertility and, and irrigation practices. But uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of mixtures of, of uh, grasses. Um, you know, if we look at the crop side, that's been shown in, in crops to help reduce disease severity when, when multiple genotypes of wheat, for instance, are used in a planting, in a field, we get better response and, and less disease pressure. There is some research going on here at UF by Dr. Adam Dale, looking at, at mixtures of genotypes of turf grass and their response or, or uh, the uh, susceptibility to insect pest problems. And he's seeing some really interesting and sort of sort of surprising results that these mixtures of genotypes can look very good. They do tend to be more resilient and, and as far as their response to, to pests and diseases. Uh, he's looking at insect pests specifically. And so, uh, so yeah, you, you don't have to have a single monoculture of one turf genotype to have a good lawn. Um, you can have mixtures that work well. Uh, the best mixtures, I think, uh, come in where we, we understand what those grasses are, their leaf textures, and we have a good idea of 
of what we're trying to do and what we're trying to, to achieve for that lawn. Um, and then take that into account using the, the, the most problematic of those that we're trying to maintain as sort of our guide for fertility, for mowing height and other uh, horticultural inputs. So, uh, so sure, yeah, we can do that. And, uh, and it does make sense. There's not a lot of, of research data I could point to for turf grass, but it is an area that uh, I think we would find that if we looked and, and probably should. The amazing University of Florida is trying to get that data as we speak, huh? <laughs> um, another one for you, Dr. Harmon. This is an interesting question. It has to do with camellias. And this, uh, someone has camellias, they have both insect damage uh, that they're trying to potentially control, but there's also some fungal damage. And they want to know, should we, should we be taking care of one before the other? One before and the you other. Hit it with like a multi, can you do a two in one type of thing? Or should you deal with one over the other? Yeah, I, I have a lot of camellias in my lawn or in my yard and landscape and, uh, and they're beautiful plants. I love, I love the, my camellias. Um, I don't see a lot of fungal disease issues on those. We, we have a common leaf spot that's uh, an algal leaf spot. Uh, we have limited things that we can do to try to increase airflow, et cetera, to reduce the, the likelihood that that becomes severe. I kind of like the way it looks on the leaves. I'm a little bit uh, weird that way, though, being a plant pathologist. You are a plant pathologist. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I like to see the algal, and, and you know, it may reduce the vigor slightly, but, but I tend to overlook those. Uh, we can have some flower blights that kind of kind of get depressing at that time of year when you have these beautiful flowers and they come in and, uh, and they knock the blooms off. Um, I don't treat mine though. I let it I let it go. I think it's uh, it's rarely significantly detrimental to the plant. So I just kind of let it run its course. Uh, insects, we, we can see some some grasshoppers, louvers, and other things feeding on those. Um, and, and we do have we do have um, management options that we could use. Uh, neem oil was mentioned earlier. It has some some efficacy for insects as well as as uh, fungal disease or, or other diseases. Uh, in general, though, I'd say you know don't worry too much about it uh, unless it's really causing you significant stress or, or killing the plants. Uh, uh, you know, kind of kind of enjoy the beauty of the disease as well as the plant and what it gets. Uh, that's been been kind of my uh, my strategy, but. But I understand some folks have a limited tolerance for that damage on their on their prized camellias. So um, insecticides, fungicides, a plan has to be in place that's integrated and that considers all of the things that could be damaging, uses those in the most efficient way possible before disease becomes severe, before insect populations get huge. Uh, follow the best management practices that we have in our EDIS guidelines and our EDIS publications and websites. Uh, and those that we link to from that, from other universities. And I think, you know, by doing that and thinking about all the potential problems we see, we can we can consult our resources and come up with a good way to uh, to address those uh, at the same time using various methods, starting with horticultural inputs and not making the problem worse, uh, ending with when we need to and have to uh, chemical pesticide options. Uh, I'm going to use that answer in the future, Dr. Harmon, that you need to enjoy the camellia flowers and the algal leaf spots. Just think of it as some other ornamental piece of the shrub there. So I like that. We'll see how that goes over. I'll let you know. Yeah, crinum lilies are another one that I, I really like that Cercosporidium leaf spot, those bright red bullseyes with the yellow rings around them. You know, I, I would never treat my crinums because uh, I like that. But, you know, I, again, I'm weird, so. <laughs> I kind of like the, uh, I'm the same with the canna lily, the leaf rollers, and they make the, the little cuts in it. And then when they open up, it looks like those things you did in school where you cut the paper and when you, after you fold it and stuff, it always looks really neat to me. Um, <laughs> all right, let's see. Uh, we're over, well, it's two o'clock over on my time zone, but we're over time. But we're going to answer a couple more, uh, and you guys can, yeah, well, you guys listening, you guys take off if you need to, but uh, we did again put that survey link in there, and we want to let you know that our next Gardening the Panhandle Live is July 29, I think. Don't quote me on that, but Julie put the link there, and it's going to be on beneficial insects, I believe. So question I want to ask about control and I want to ask this to Matt or Watt. The is there a temperature at which you know once it gets above this temperature, should they not be using fungicides? So I, we know with various horticulture oils, maybe herbicides, 
there are some the temperature right. does that exist for fungicide well it depends on the fungicide so uh if you read the label it'll tell you uh usually if there's a temperature restriction i know with uh if you're using chlorothalonil which is often sold as daconil if it's above 85 to 90 it can cause phytotoxicity on some species if if you use it above certain temperatures and with neem oil there's certain kinds of neem oil that have less impact if you use them at high temperatures. So you need to look at which neem oil you're getting. But any kind of oil-based uh, fungicide will also have common sense, um, uh, some type of uh, problem if you uh, if you use it too much during really hot temperatures, you could get some burn in there. <coughs> usually your, pardon me, I have a, a tickle in my throat, but usually your um, systemic fungicides tend not to have issues with temperature. You know, so if you're using a systemic, meaning systemic fungicides go are applied, but they go through the plant and become uh, part of the plant tissue and for a brief period of time. And a lot of those do not tend to have issues with temperature. Okay, thank you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, this will be open to the group. This is one of the ones that was asked during the discussion. And they're asking, they, ha they have a whitish substance on their coleus plant that apparently killed the plants. I'm not sure if this was a whitish substance, the stems, the maybe the bottoms of the leaves. Anyone wanna take on some weird whitish substance that could potentially be killing coleus? You know, to me, that sounds like mealybugs, just off the top of my head. Uh, anyone else have thoughts? That would be a good guess. Um, uh insect pest like mealybug. There is a downy mildew. That, so I would ask which side of the leaf was it on? The underside of the leaf with a, a white uh, powdery substance can be downy mildew and those, those do occur on coleus and, and can, can seriously affect some varieties. So that'd be another potential option. Well, can mealybugs actually take a plant all the way down? Yeah, I was, I was thinking maybe it might've been the downy mildew again. I'm not sure, but we, that's something where um, I think that's Miriam asked the question. Miriam, that's where, you know, a really good thing to do would be to contact your local county extension agent and send a photo, you know, take a good picture. One good trick I get, you know, I want to tell people because, you know, we often get just photos that are really out of focus and you can't really tell what you're looking at, but, you know, hold the plant, you know, or the bug in your hand kind of thing, or put your hand right behind it. And use that to help you focus on the critter you're trying to get a picture of because we oftentimes get pictures of a something that is very blurry and out of focus and we're asked you know what is this and what do i do about it but we don't we don't know what it is either so um that's just a little trick but what i would recommend there is take a picture send it into your local extension agent and have them uh, do some research and help you figure out what that might be uh, several pictures from different angles and different parts of the plant several Yes, I just got a message from from somebody that said, I wish we had more pictures. Well, this picture came down the chain from three different people. So I was like, well, I only have this one. So. Right. Uh, Matt, this one is definitely for you. If we're propagating roses, uh, Mutabilis rose, Louis Philippe, do we to get that disease resistance? Do we need to graft those onto rootstock of your uh, your Fortuniana? Well, um, <clears throat> rootstock in general has not been proven to provide a leaf resistance, resistance. There's some speculation, but it's mainly for root disease resistance. Okay, like uh, if there's a root rot or some kind of nematode or something. But for example, Louis Philippe and Muchabilis are already uh, fairly resistant to our local diseases, and they grow well in our climate as own root roses. So I would say they, in general, do not need to be grafted because they they're they're a species of rose, a subspecies called the Chinensis subspecies. They're part of the Rosa Chinensis group. And so those roses are already adapted to warm, hot, humid climates. Okay, so we're going to just root them. Because I don't want to get you too far down the rose. So you can just root, take cuttings, root them, and enjoy them. Okay. Now, one more, uh, at least one more here. And we'll, we'll stay till Julie tells me we got to stop talking. But uh, we got a question from someone that was listening in. Uh, I believe it was you, Matt, that mentioned for powdery mildew, you know, at, at certain temperature, it stops becoming active. Now, if we let, if we just let the powdery mildew go and we wait for those 90 degree days where we're going to go, want to go in the AC anyway, 
uh, is this going to cause permanent damage to the the plant? So is it can the plant recover from this, or should we rather go out and do something than you know well, rather leave it alone? To, to me, to me, it depends because if you're growing vegetables, it can decimate an annual vegetable. But for for a shrub, uh, it'll make them look ugly for a while, but they'll recover because powdery mildew doesn't become part of the cane structure like black spot does. So it'll go away and it won't cause any permanent damage except for reduced growth rates and lack of vigor. But the plants usually recover. Yeah, I like to remind folks that in the, especially in the ornamental setting, the we're not getting paid or we're not paying our bills based on the camellias and the roses in our garden, right? So if you are a farmer that is paying the bills based on what you're growing, uh, you want to be, you know, very much on top of these things, not to reduce your yield, but it's really important in that ornamental setting to be able to tolerate some level of damage. Um, and because you know, a lot of these, like we've talked about today, it's no real easy fix. Sometimes you need to ask yourself, is it really worth it uh, to, you know, kind of take all these um, interventions, I guess we'll say. So, I do want to, uh, I think we need to wrap up here. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us on Zoom and on Facebook. I wanna thank all of our amazing panelists. So thank you, Larry, Stephen, Matthew, and a special thank you to Dr. Harmon for joining us from Gainesville. Thanks, Dr. Harmon. Uh, maybe we'll get you back uh, for another one. My pleasure. And I also wanna thank all of the folks in the background. We got Pat, Williams from Wakulla. There he is. Hey, Pat. Uh, Matt Lawler and Julie McConnell as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please fill out the survey and then please check us out next month for beneficial insects. And yes, this is recorded. I know someone was asking. This is recorded. You'll be able to see this. And I believe maybe in about a week or so, you can check the Garden in the Panhandle uh, web page for uh, a link to that video. So mm -hmm. Thank you all. We're getting lots of thank yous in the chat, everyone, so that you know. Uh, several folks saying they learned so much. That's what we're here for. And that'll be the perfect ending. Um, thank you all for joining and see you next time on Garden the Panhandle Live.